And I'm an open source investigator and trainer. Okay, so uh, yeah, well, being an open source investigator, uh, I do investigations. Um, I come from Kyrgyzstan, so my main focus is in Central Asia, but I'm also looking into conspiracies in Europe and uh, um, data-driven investigations and many, many other things, as well as the war reporting in Ukraine, but also in Tajikistan. Okay, and yeah, let's dive into our presentation. Uh, this will be a little bit interactive at some points, okay? So I'll be needing uh, sometimes for you to raise your hands. So yeah, the, and the first question when we're talking about open source investigation is uh, what is open source investigation, of course? What is open source research? And some of you might know uh, it is, um, uh, it's an investigation where a researcher and a reader have uh, equal access to the information. Okay, so how it happens in traditional journalism, journalists might go um, do, do a field trip, might do an interview, or have some uh, sources they can reach out to, right? But in open source investigation, researchers such as we, we're doing everything uh, at our laptops and we're searching information uh, that's available publicly. So theoretically, if I do an investigation, uh, you would be able to do the same thing, okay, to uh, reiterate each step. So this is the main difference. The researcher, which is a journalist, analyst, or investigator, has the same uh, access to information as the reader slash listener, okay? Uh, in our case, we include the information with a paywall, being as open source, so this can be a subscription to a, a news channel. So say you want to subscribe to an economist or a Wall Street Journal, it costs a few bucks. And uh, of course, in, uh, like in many cases, there is a high possibility that, uh, that somebody else has already written about the subject you're interested in. Yeah? And then when we want to check out this information, of course, we subscribe and we read this info. And we uh, think, yeah, this is also an open source information because everyone uh, with a budget would get access to it. So this can be as cheap as a couple bucks, but uh, also expensive as uh, being a couple thousand of dollars for a satellite imagery. So we use satellite imagery a lot at Valencat. Uh, it's primarily Google Earth, but we also have paid subscription uh, to services like Planet, which costs, yeah, I think around $1,000, $2,000 a month, but uh, this gives us an access to a huge amount of satellite imagery, okay? So there is this um, I'd say budget barrier, of course, but we uh, still consider it it's an open source. And uh, why is this important? Because uh, when Belkia just launched in 2014, so it's a relatively new organization, and to build trust uh, among our readers, we, uh, our founder decided to do everything uh, open source because he really liked it, he was really into it, and then he could see that when he did an open source investigation, readers could actually uh, look at each step and uh, confirm that, yep, this is a trustworthy information. So the reader doesn't have to take our word for, uh, for an investigation, they can just find the same photo or geolocate the same photo and uh, do the research themselves. Okay? So, yeah, the great uh, thing about open source that it provides transparency and the credibility to the investigation. And yeah, in an ideal world, again, consumer, uh, the reader will be able to do the same investigation. So, open source materials, what are those? So, we have these four blocks uh, of open source materials categories, okay? So, first of all is the geospatial, the fancy word for uh, mapping services. So these are the things like Google Maps, Yandex Carte, which is basically Yandex Maps, Terra Server, Planet Subscription, and etc. So uh, uh, this one is very, very useful for, uh, for many things. One is, of course, for geolocation. So if you have a photo and want to find out where exactly it was taken, or you want to verify that this image is showing, um, I don't know, it's just showing the uh, Netherlands and not Belgium, and things like that. So in this case, um, Mapping services, they help a lot. Another thing that you can do uh, is, for example, just tracking the changes. So, for example, on Google Earth Pro, so you know on Google Maps it will show you the latest satellite imagery. But on Google Earth Pro, which is the app, uh, you can see actually the historical images. And then you can trace the historical changes, basically. You can see if 
um, if some construction has been made, if the mining project is going on, if some uh, forest fire caught up and the consequences could be seen on the maps, okay? And many, many different things. The second one is media. Of course, as I've said, there is a high chance that media has already published something about the research topic you're investigating, and uh, that's why we always check out what's there. So, yeah, these are just all the different medias that are out there. In most of the cases, uh, how our research works is that we are reading some article, and we see they're mentioning some photo or some interesting thing that they didn't follow up on, and uh, we say, oh, that sounds interesting for us, we could probably do something about it, and then we base on research on it. The third one is user-generated uh, content, which is basically yeah, everything on social media that users are posting. You all perfectly know how much information is out there on YouTube, on LinkedIn, on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, Vkontakte, and et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so we use this information a lot. And the last one is databases and archived materials, so basically human knowledge of the world. This can be uh, um, databases of books, like Google eBooks. It can be governmental databases of companies, like Companies House. It can be a private database of companies, like ne LexisNexis, which costs some money. Uh, information from Internet Archive, which has an archive of millions of websites, but also books, videos, and etc. So these are all the uh, main four categories where we get our information from, okay? And you all, yeah, are uh, quite used to those. And here are some other four categories that we do use from uh, time to time. These are called gray area open source materials. Why gray area? Because there's a lot of question about ethics about them, okay? Not all journalists consider the sources as open source, uh, some journals do, some journals don't, because of the ethical reasons, okay? So, for example, we do use leaked material. So this can be uh, information from Wikileaks, but it can be also information uh, from uh, leaked passwords and leaked, uh, like leaked platforms, like from Dehashed, Intellex, and etc. It can be databases that we can buy uh, on, uh, yeah, buy basically in the internet or find on Torrid. Here's an example of a um, database of um, Russian airlines. So Russian airlines, uh, which is called Aeroflot, uh, a couple of years ago we had a huge leak. So we could find um, uh, info about the passengers. Uh, if you're searching for a person, you could see their uh, past flights, their date of birth, their passport information, the people they flew with, so basically the people they uh, bought tickets together with. Okay? So this kind of information. So if it, if it has been leaked, we uh, um, might use this material depending on the investigation. So I'll talk about uh, a bit about in the next slides uh, when we do justify using those. Because, yeah, there's, of course, two sides of it. So in one case, it can help us to find this GRU agent, agent FSB agent, or like any other, any other bad guy, okay? But there is also another, uh, another ethical issue is that because uh, some, yeah, because uh, by buying this information, we're incentivizing, of course, uh, hackers to get this data, to leak this data, or uh, we are supporting this, yeah, this platform which shares uh, personal information of lots of people. Okay? So there's this trade-off, and in each case we uh, always have a, a discussion if it's really worth uh, looking at this data. Okay? So we wouldn't just check it for some random uh, person, but only when it, um, it would be in the public interest. Okay? Next one is contact books which is apps like GetContact, TrueCaller, SyncMe. Has anybody heard about them? No? Okay. Uh, some of you might, I think. Uh, these are the apps that you basically you download it to your phone, and uh, you give them access to your contact book. Okay? So when somebody else... So the great thing about it is if somebody else that you don't know is calling you, it will tell you the name of this person. Okay? It can tell you right away that it's a scam, or it can tell you right away that it's a bank, or some uh, person's name. So how this works is, uh, as I said, when you download it, you give access to your contact book. And when there are lots of people who downloaded it, downloaded it the uh, app will have a huge contact cloud. Right? And then you can do searches, you can search for this person, and then find how this person has been saved in some other users. Okay? So, for example, 
let's say that um, I never downloaded this get contact book, right? So I never download it, I don't have my information on it. But my sister, for example, she doesn't care, okay? She does care about her, like, contacts being leaked, or she might have not read that um, terms, and uh, she agreed to that. So if she, if she said me as, like, sister, okay, uh, then if you would search for my phone number, you would find that someone has saved me as sister, okay? If she saved me as Iranish, uh, I don't know, like, Iranish, my name, then you would find that uh, someone saved me as Iranish, okay? So this is a great way to... Um, find information about people, because, uh, because usually these uh, like bad guys, or just in general, like people who don't want uh, their information to be public, they have no say on it, right? Because if my sister, if my friend, if my colleague uh, downloaded this uh, app and they had my contact, then I'll, my information will be exposed there, okay? So, yeah, this is, <laughs> this is sketchy things about contact books, uh, and that's why they're in this gray area open source. But we uh, do use them quite often. Again, when we have a phone number and we want to find out who this phone number belongs to. The next one exposed databases, database on MySQL, Amazon Web Services, but also like Google Sheets and stuff. And these are the databases that uh, users have, but they um, don't really know that they made this database public. And then again, there's this ethical question. Um, that are you going to use this information uh, when the user didn't actually know that they made it public, okay? And the last one is dark web markets, uh, like Silk Road, Dream Market. We don't often, we don't really do our research there. We just, this is a place for us to sometimes download leaked databases, but yeah, that's pretty it. Okay. So what is open source? This is a source that is freely available to the public. Uh, as I said, this can uh, include a paywall, but in most of the cases, we do use uh, free tools. Okay, and I'll show you. Uh, I'll show a few uh, at the end that we use. Okay, uh, and this does not include directing or requesting hacking, uh, stealing or spying but it can include accessing uh, publicly available leaked data, okay? So you're never gonna like, come up to a hacker and say, hey, could you hack this person's social media or hack this database? Uh, but what, what we are gonna do, if some hacker has already leaked it, if some organization has already leaked it, we uh, might use this information, okay? So, yeah, and just uh, remember that when we are doing a research, uh, it, uh, yeah, the results that we have will depend on uh, lots of different factors. If you are looking into a person, it, it will, of course will depend on how much digital um, footprint this person leaves. Uh, we will also look uh, at the platforms this person is using. So, for example, if you are looking to Vkontakte or uh, Facebook, uh, Vkontakte is basically a face, uh, Russian Facebook. So, if you are doing a research on Facebook, and if uh, you can't really go out of Facebook to many other places, whereas if you're researching on Vkontakte, even if the account was closed, you would still be able to see their friends list, you would still be uh, able to find out their date of birth, their uh, old profiles, uh, old bios, and etc. just because Vkontakte is more research friendly and uh, it can get scraped, okay? The same uh, with WhatsApp and Telegram. So Telegram is uh, also a messaging app uh, similar to WhatsApp, but it just has more features, and again, it's more research friendly. And if you're uh, doing an investigation based on WhatsApp, it would be extremely difficult because you can't really find groups, uh, you can't really find different channels and stuff, but if you found a Telegram, you can, first of all, do a search on different groups, even on private groups, on uh, channels, private channels, and stuff like that. And if you find an account, you'll also be able to find their username and, and then just continue and continue your search, okay? So it really depends on what platform they're using. Another thing to remember is the uh, privacy uh, legis legislation uh, in uh, the country they're residing in. So for example, same with Russia. So in Russia, the, uh, the government was collecting lots of lots of information about the citizens, and uh, they were intending to do this private, they keep it to themselves for their, their use, but it uh, gets hacked all the time, and that's why you can find a person, like a Russian citizen's 
passport information easily, their flight record, their uh, cars, where the car is registered, the phone number uh, that they used, and etc. So lots of information there. So if you're looking to uh, like on information about Kyrgyzstan, it's somewhere in between. You can find some information. So if you were to research me, you would find my full name. Uh, with my paternal name, you'd find out my date of birth, my relatives, the village I used to live in Kyrgyzstan, and things like that, because this information was made um, intentionally public, okay? But you can't really go uh, further than that. Uh, whereas in uh, Germany, for example, it's completely closed off, uh, because their, uh, yeah, their uh, privacy and data legislation is uh, much better, that I'd say. So it really depends on the countries you're researching in, okay? So yeah, open source investigations called a new genre of journalism and beyond. Uh, again, when our founder started Bellingcat, it was 2014, it was quite new, and he was one of those pioneers. And nowadays, it has really caught uh, up, let's say. So for example, New York Times has a great visual investigations team uh, where they do great just investigations uh, into different matters, and they've won uh, a couple of Pulitzer Prizes for it. Uh, Washington Post has also their visual forensics team. BBC uh, Africa Eye uh, has also done some great investigations. So here uh, there was uh, this investigation called Anatomy of a Killing. Um, just an amazing investigation that uh, BBC Africa have done. So what happened uh, was that there was a Facebook video circulating on the internet with uh, some soldiers executing uh, women and children. So th there was like this horrific uh, video. Uh, it was allegedly uh, uh, shot in Cameroon, and the people, the executors, were Cameroon soldiers, okay, allegedly. Uh, but the government uh, would deny this, saying this is fake news. Uh, I don't know, this is uh, from, a, I don't know, from a movie or something, or some other different place, so it's not uh, true, they were basically claiming. And then what if, uh, BBC Africa did, they, first of all, they geolocated this place. So you could see uh, just a tiny bit, uh, just a, uh, a short video uh, showing the soldier walking with women and children. And you could see some uh, place around, like the road, how the roads looked, what buildings there were, and etc. So they were able to geolocate it and confirm that, yes, this was actually shot in Cameroon. And then they were able also to uh, confirm that these were actually Cameroon soldiers. Any guess how to do that? Okay, I guess, yeah? Uh, number ID in their uniform? Yes, so looking at their uniform actually was very easy to check. Uh, they, what they did was they just Googled like Cameron uniform and they could see that this matches exactly the same. So they had to be the ones. And yeah, as the result uh, of this investigation, it was confirmed that this video is true and the children and women were executed by Cameroon soldiers, and later they were convicted of murder. Okay? So this is what uh, verification and uh, geolocation can lead to. Uh, this is also getting popular um, in the uh, non-governmental organizations, in the human rights organizations. So here's, for example, a vacancy for a human rights watch for open source investigations had. UN also uh, has a team of open source investigators, okay? Again, uh, this is all because um, people know how much uh, power uh, like this open source has hold. Uh, you don't uh, have to necessarily be in the, I don't know, in the conflict zone or be on site to do investigations. You can sometimes uh, do it uh, just online, okay? Searching for relevant videos on internet, searching for relevant videos in the, local region, uh, in the local language, on YouTube, on TikTok, and et cetera. And uh, yeah, and since there are so many uh, information that is out there on the internet, you can apply it to a great range of topics, okay? So this can be conflict zone, and conflict zone usually are the ones that get the most attention. Uh, they're not, uh, I wouldn't say necessarily that these are the most popular investigations uh, that are there, but uh, that, that researchers do, but these are the ones that get the most attention. So for example, uh, right now at Bellingcat, we, uh, we have this project where we're looking at the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and what we are doing is we are uh, basically collecting all those photos, videos posted in Ukraine, okay? So yeah, as you know, there are lots of people who are just 
um, taking photos of damages, of murder, of different atrocities, and we at Balancat, we are collecting those, we are verifying that this uh, indeed happened in Ukraine, and, not, and also it is new, it's not from the, like 10 years ago or from another place. We are also geolocating it, confirming yeah, that yes, this was, uh, like this video was done in Lysychansk, uh, this uh, hospital uh, was located in Lysychansk, this number, like, you know, five schools, etc., in Kiev, uh, and etc. Okay, so we are trying to geolocate it, and then um, uh, we have this nice database of all these incidents. We are specifically focusing on civilian harm done in Ukraine. And then uh, this gets transferred into a nice map where people, like anybody, can access it and see the cases, the incidents of civilian harm that we were able to verify and geolocate and confirm. Okay? And why is this useful? It is useful because uh, the, first of all, like other researchers, other journalists can do their investigations based on this uh, data. Uh, the government, different justice and accountability bodies can use this information because this has been uh, verified and uh, vetted by, yeah, by our staff. Okay? And lots of other places. So, for example, uh, I'm currently looking also at the uh, protests uh, that turned deadly in Tajikistan. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, my colleagues have looked at Yemen, Syria, and also many different other places, okay? So this can be uh, applied to any country, let's say. Yep, the next one is environmental research. Again, quite uh, uh, popular, I'd say. Uh, just again, using uh, different uh, mapping services, you can see the changes in um, I don't know, in the um, like sea level, on the uh, level of the lakes, uh, you can see deforestation, and many different stuff. But you can also look at the mapping services, not only with the satellite imagery, but also with uh, different radars to see uh, how the moisture index has changed, how the vegetation index has changed, and etc. Okay? And lots of other different things, basically, again, looking for photos, uh, for videos posted on YouTube, uh, Facebook, and etc. Then there is corruption and financial research. Uh, I've, done, uh, uh, I've done a few investigations of the corruption, corruption in Central Asia. And these are the cases, uh, for example, in my case, it was the fact that there was this very, very um, uh, wealthy and influential corrupt family, but no one could prove that they were corrupt, right? And uh, what we were able to do is uh, find their Instagram accounts and Adnaklasniki accounts, which is like basically, again, Russian Facebook, of uh, their family members. And um, we could see that they have, uh, they're having this luxurious lifestyle that they uh, would not be able to afford on their um, government salary. We were also able to find their nanny of this, uh, of this particular family who was posting uh, photos with private jets with the kids of this family who was uh, doing a whole video tour of their new apartment in Dubai. Uh, whole 10 minutes of saying, like, my bosses have just bought this apartment, and we could see from their wife's Instagram account that this is her apartment because she posted videos. The walls were the same, the doors were the same, and like different, um, different furniture. And then we could confirm that uh, like when this nanny posted a photo from, her, uh, from this uh, like penthouse window, we could geolocate it. We could find that it's located in the, um, uh, in the uh, most expensive area of Dubai, uh, in, in uh, this building, and it was a penthouse, and uh, this cost a few million dollars. And again, this family was making uh, around $10,000 a year on uh, their governmental job being there head of uh, Texas um, in uh, Kyrgyzstan, and there was no way they were able to afford it. So this came as a crucial evidence, uh, uh, yeah, crucial evidence to actually uh, prove that uh, they are corrupt, and then later they uh, had to confirm it, and they, uh, yeah, he was basically arrested, okay? There are also things like HR, criminal, person-focused research, of course, and historical research. And the fun fact is librarians are actually the first open uh, uh, source investigators because they used the um, information that was publicly available. So, yeah. And lots of also other different things, okay? It's just the ones that are uh, more popular uh, right now. So, yeah. And what is Bellingcat? Um, how many of you have heard about Valencat before? Okay, okay, I'll skip this one then. 
<laughs> so yeah, we have our website. We publish in uh, English, Russian, and Ukrainian. Some uh, articles get translated. Uh, some of the most uh, popular ones are our investigations into Syria. So Elad Higgins, our founder, uh, he started actually with Syria. In his free time, he would just uh, research what's going on there. It was like during 2013, 2014. Because there was, it was very difficult to find information about the Syrian war. Because it was, uh, for journalists, it was very risky to go there. And what he figured, that he can actually uh, like find videos uh, of what's going on there in Arabic. Because local people were also uh, posting photos and videos of what's happening. And uh, journalists uh, just didn't know how to find it. And he was just yeah, basically searching uh, the same terms in Arabic. He, would able, he was able to find videos. He would geolocate them and confirm that, yeah, here are chemical weapons being used and stuff like that. So he had actually no background in anything like that. He never, had a, yeah, he never knew how to differentiate uh, among different weapons. But then he, just by uh, Googling, uh, he became an expert at the end. Okay? Uh, there is MH17, the downing of the Malaysian Boeing over Ukraine in uh, 2014. Again, when this one happened, um, uh, no one really knew what was going on. Russia was blaming Ukraine, Ukraine was blaming Russia, and, uh, uh, and no one knew who was responsible for killing almost 300 people. And uh, what we decided to do at that point uh, is again turn to social media. Uh, so you all know that the uh, Boeing cannot be shot by just a random weapon. It has to be a missile launcher, right? A rocket system, some. Uh, so, and there are not that many uh, like missile launchers in Ukraine and Russia. And we suspected that if there was uh, a missile launcher traveling, it would be with a convoy, uh, with a military convoy. And some people would, of course, see it. Some like uh, citizens would be, uh, would be able to see it and then upload it to the internet. So we started just searching on YouTube, on uh, local social medias for a keyword military convoy. Um, and then we started finding photos and videos that people uh, were actually seeing it a few days, uh, a couple of weeks before the downing of the Boeing. And then we were able to geolocate those and then make this map. So this uh, missile launcher was spotted in uh, Russia going to the border at this point of time. Then a couple of days later, it was spotted in uh, Ukraine uh, at this place at this point of time. And then we could see that it actually traveled from Russia. And after the downing, we could again find the photos and videos of this uh, missile launcher of the book. And when it was going back, we could see it was missing one missile. Okay? And yeah, this is, uh, this is just an example of how uh, we looked at it. We also looked at the uh, uh, military units that were near uh, Ukraine. Okay, so one of the closest would be uh, Kursk, which is in Russia. And then we uh, started searching for, uh, uh, for uh, soldiers who worked at this Kursk military unit. Because same is, uh, as on Facebook, like people, oh, like these people are like 19, 20, 21. They would, of course, indicate in their bios on their social medias that they work at this military unit. And then we would find their social medias, we would find that they were actually uh, taking photos with a book, they were in this convoy posting photos, because for them it was, uh, it was quite exciting. It was uh, probably, again, they're like in their, they're 19, they're 20, they must have been their first trip, so they have uploaded lots of pictures on social media. And it was 2014, they had no idea that uh, this info could be used, okay? So yeah, then we have Skripal and Navalny poisonings, um, where we've actually used uh, quite a few of this gray area, um, gray area uh, sources. So uh, th there was a yeah, poisoning of Skripals uh, and Navalny by Novichok. And uh, uh, yeah, again, in both of the cases, uh, it was not really clear what happened. So what we did, we uh, used uh, this uh, gray open source area, so leaked databases. If we had a name, we would search for uh, this name and see if this name has um, uh, any uh, car register to it, uh, passport information, and etc. Uh, we would uh, find different flight records of these people. So for the, uh, I think it was for a Navalny investigation, uh, we were searching for people who were traveling um, with him, okay, on, a, on the same route. 
and we eventually found some people that turned out to be traveling with him for a few years, so they were tracing him. And then, uh, yeah, we could find their passport info, their full name, uh, their phone number, and then we'd go to, to those contact books, like Get Contact, Truecaller, and searching for this phone number, we could see that... Uh, so this is a Telegram bot, okay, which is basically works on Get Contact, and we uploaded a phone number, and it would tell us, tell us how this phone number was saved. Again, this was a phone number of... Um, uh, of an uh, agent, probably, and then he for sure did not have this app uh, downloaded. But some of his friends did, some of his family members did, and they uh, saved him as Vladimir Panyaev, Panyaev Vladimir, and FSB, Vladimir Alexandrovich Panyaev, okay? So these things happen a lot, okay? Saying like this FSB, because people usually save them as like where they know them from, right? And then we look at their phone records uh, with this Navalny investigation, since we had a phone number, we went a little step further. So in Russia, uh, you might know there's a lot of corruption going on, same in Kyrgyzstan, and in both of these countries you can actually um, uh, find different uh, websites uh, of uh, the workers from mobile operators, okay? They work for these mobile operators, and they'll get you their phone record of a phone number that you're looking for, okay? So we requested this information that did cost us some money, but we could find out, like, all the phone numbers this phone number called. And, uh, of course, it would be, like, other high-ranking FSB officials, there would be a commander and stuff like that, but we also could see the location, okay, where this uh, was, where the, the person was when doing a call when the phone was on. And, yeah, you should remember that this is, uh, like, FSB agents, they are also people, they do mistakes, uh, some dumb of them. So, for example, they have this rule, they are not supposed to turn on their phone when they're on a mission, because they can get tracked. And what they did, uh, actually, was when they were near the hotel of Navalny, uh, they actually turned on their phone for three seconds. And these three seconds were enough to get the location from the mobile operator. And since we bought this data, we could also find it. So let's do a quick example, uh, which is called Locating IT Supporters. 2016, you might remember there was a huge campaign by IT supporters taking photos and saying that they are actually, uh, they live in Europe, they're uh, in this city, and they're actually among, uh, yeah, uh, and they're not, basically, they're not far away, but uh, in Münster, for example, in Paris, to uh, spread terror, okay? So what you would find is uh, this kind of photo uh, posted on Twitter, and this one says, like, ISIS supporter, uh, like, Germany, Münster, okay? And lots of ISIS supporters would do that to spread fear that, again, these ISIS supporters are not somewhere uh, far away, but uh, here in their cities, okay? And the open source community started jellicating it. And let's do it together. So please... Uh, yeah, just shout out a place that, shout out uh, the details you see that can help you find out where exactly this is. Yeah, Peter's Minster, yes? Yes. Could you please repeat the question for the Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, so we want to find out where exactly this photo was taken. So what are the details that will help you? We have a, a first sensor saying the bus. Yeah, you can actually just Google Münster bus and find out that Münster has similar buses. Uh, we cannot see really the number, okay, because it was uploaded on Twitter, so the route we didn't really know. Yep. Yeah, there is a poster, and this is also <laughs> very important. Uh, we couldn't really find, figure out what was written there and what advertisement it was, but then it got very useful, okay? Yeah? Yes. Yeah, so now we're looking at the micro details. So uh, if you find some similar place, the details you would cross-reference, okay, to make sure this is the right place. So yeah, there's a white building in behind. What else? Uh-huh, you can see the trees. You can see the lights, I've heard. Yeah, you can see that there is one light there. Two of them. Yes, there is also a big shadow, okay? What do you think it is? It might be a bridge, it might be a building, but there, we'll go back to it later, but if you look at this place, 
It will give you a hint what this is, okay? So yeah, we could see also the crosswalk, okay? The crosswalk here, a few trees here, and yeah, these are the things. So we couldn't figure out where this uh, place is, so what we did, we posted on Twitter saying, hey, does anybody recognize this place? Does, does anyone know how to find this place? And then this uh, German resident tells us uh, on Twitter, just replies saying, actually in Germany, uh, there is a map with all uh, advertisement stands, okay? And then you can find it. So we went to this website. You can see there were just hundreds of these advertisement columns. So we, do, we go to Google Maps to do a satellite imagery, and then we start uh, filtering the ones that uh, could be, okay? Now, I'm going to give you six uh, options, okay? And you'll tell me which one is right, okay? Now look again at the details in this photo. What do those lights tell you? Yes, there is a crossing, yeah, there is an intersection in there. Okay. So, look at all the details. Okay, let's go. The first one. Do you think it is the right place? Why not? Yes, no crossing. By the way, this uh, green thing means this is where the advert ad was, okay, the column. What about this one? Okay, I'm hearing a no. Let's look in the third one. Oh, it might be too light for you, yeah? Oops. I'm sorry? Yes. There is no white building across the street. That's right. Okay. What about the fourth one? Oh, I'm sorry. Not any everyone can see it. Oh, perfect. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. What do you think about this one? Okay. I'm seeing and hearing maybes. Okay. Number five. What's that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not roundabout because they don't have lights. That's good. And the last one. Okay, who thinks it's a number one? Number two. Okay, I've got one, maybe. Number three. Number four. Okay, let's look at number four then. So now, now we're going to zoom in, okay? And now we're going to look at the micro details, okay? On the small details uh, that match. So what do you see matching? Yeah, I can hear traffic lights. So here's one traffic light, the, yeah, and then here's the another one. And you can see it's also uh, this shape, okay? This. Yeah, so here, here's the shape. You can see it's not straight, it's curved, and here's the same. Anything else? I'm sorry? Four legs? Oh, that might be tricky, because uh, this is satellite imagery from Google, and it was taken, I think, a few years before this took place, okay? So yeah, unfortunately, maybe you can do it, but we cannot access the satellites that are doing it the exact time, okay? So, uh, yeah? Yes, the, uh, yeah, the lines. So you can see there is one thick line here, the same as here. I'm not sure if you're able to see it here, but there is also another one uh, dashed, the thinner one. And you can see it here too. Yep. You can see uh, also uh, this barrier, you might think it's a shadow, it's actually a barrier. And then you have a question about the shadow. Does anyone have a guess what the shadow means? This huge shadow. Huh? Direction, Direction of what? The shadow. Yeah, yeah. Why is it so huge? Yes, that's right. So uh, they, this photo was uploaded around 7 a.m., 8 a.m., 
and the shadow is much uh, longer than this in this Google photo. So the satellite uh, images are usually taken at noon, at some time close to noon, to get the least amount of shadow. Okay. So here's just an example that you can also track different projects. Okay. And. Uh, And yeah, now we're going to do another exercise, but just give me a second. We are finishing at 12, right? Oh, OK. So I was so, I thought 12. OK, let me give you another example uh, about the overflowing of information. So uh, open source investigations are not a uh, uh, black magic, OK? So we can only find what's there out in the internet. Uh, but it also has its own challenges. So one challenge is that you cannot find that information that you need, meaning that there are, there's just so little information about this person or about this event. Another is the opposite, having just this huge amount of information. Okay? So here's an example. Uh, 2017, uh, this white supremacist uh, protests in Charlottesville in the U.S. A photo gets posted uh, saying that three, this, uh, three white dudes uh, beat up a black kid, and then this black kid uh, yeah, ended up in a hospital uh, with uh, lots of injuries. And we wanted to find out who this person is. Okay? So all we have is this one blurry picture, and we know that this is a Charlottesville event uh, in August 2017. So how do you think we can find this person? What would your, be your first step? The, yeah, I can see the helmet here and there. So you can see this, he's wearing a helmet, white helmet. And if you look closer, you'll also see that he has stickers, black and red, that makes it quite unique. Okay? That's good. So you know how to differentiate him from other people? Yeah? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what we did. We uh, started looking for other photos and videos published about this event. Uh, we did like hashtag Charlotte as well on Twitter, on Facebook, but we also just Googled and tried to find out as many photos and videos as possible. Okay? So eventually, uh, Eric was able to, uh, he, yeah, he looked through a thousand of images and he eventually was able to find uh, this, uh, this guy. Do you think it's the same person? Could be. Why is that? Yeah, shirt is the same, I'm hearing. Yeah, stickers also match, I'm hearing. Yeah. So the shirt matches, uh, and the stickers also match. Okay, so you can see there's uh, this black sticker, uh, but also red sticker. And also, if you zoom in, you'll be able to see that there's something written in here. And you, yeah, and this one's also match, saying, Something killer, maybe? Yeah, something like this. And yeah. Uh, but again, so now we found uh, a couple of uh, images of him where we can see his face. Uh, but again, uh, on these images, there was no text, no usernames, no names, etc. So what we do is, yeah, we just continue searching for this person, and then eventually we find this guy. So uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, some of you would suggest doing a facial recognition, but this one was back in 2017, and facial recognition in this case did not help. But nowadays, I'm pretty sure you would be able to find something. So then we find this guy. Do you think it's the same person? Yeah. Yes, because of the birthmarks. That's right. So yeah, the birthmarks are the same, and he's also wearing a chain. And uh, yeah, if you look at his ear, it also has the same form. But again, we, we found another picture of him, but we didn't know who he is. So the next step for us would be searching for his friends. Okay? It was the exact same, the, the exact same thing. Because uh, we could see in the photos that he was always uh, with these guys, so we assume that uh, these are his friends, and we find, if we find information on them, then we might find information on them. So we do the same thing, and then we find this Twitter account called Yes, You're Racist, basically exposing all these white supremacists on the protest. Okay? So they posted this photo and screenshots from Facebook accounts of these guys. So we go to their profiles, being fine, we find Jacob Dix. You can see that the same guy. 
We can see Ryan Martin. Do you think these are the same people? Why is that? Yes, tattoos. Okay, so here we're 100% sure that this is the same guy. We will look at their friend list, and then we can see that Jacob Dix, the blonde guy, is friends with Ryan Martin. And then we just go through his friends list because we expect that, uh, that uh, the, the first person to be his friend. And we find this Dan Bok Borden. Here is the guy. We can see that he's friends with Jacob Dix and Ryan Martin. And then here are photos of him. Okay? Do you think it's the same guy? Yeah, birth marks. So you can see that he has the same birth marks, he's wearing the same chain. And yeah, if you again look at the ears, it will be the same. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, this is how, uh, just by uh, sitting at computer, Eric, I think it took him around two weeks maybe, he was uh, able to go from this blurry photo to actually uh, the name of this guy, okay? And then uh, about two months after the investigation, the uh, guy, Daniel Bar Borden, was arrested and found guilty. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, other challenges is that ethical concerns. Okay, uh, that I've told you about. Uh, where do you draw the line on gathering personal information on someone? So, uh, um, uh, for example, if you are looking, uh, if you are looking into neo-Nazi groups, uh, really, do you think it's okay to create a fake profile? Uh, with some uh, other men's like photos and pretend they're also white supremacists to get into this group and then infiltrate and check out all the data, okay? You might find it's okay, you might find not, it's not okay. Or if you're looking at this, um, I don't know, at this person, are you gonna create a fake profile of their friend to friend them and then uh, once you get access to that information, delete it immediately? Again, uh, I think most of the people would say no, but still some journalists would do it, okay? So it really depends on the line where you draw, where we draw as a researcher, as an organization, and of course, depending on the uh, law of the country. Okay, and yeah, if you're interested in this open source uh, investigations, you can look at our tools. Uh, we have our uh, toolkit at this link, because by the way, I'm gonna send you uh, the presentation, I'm gonna send the presentation to organizers so you, so you can get it, okay? And also there is a great book of Michael Bezos, Open Source Intelligence Techniques. It's very thick and it basically has everything, um, yeah, everything that uh, a researcher would need. So yeah, sorry we're a little bit late for questions. Hi, uh, thanks. I just checked the program and I think the next one up is at one. Um, so um, I think we have some time for questions. Yeah, let's, let's just let's just do so. Yeah. So okay. You... Thank you for your presentation. I wonder uh, how many languages do you master, and how do you approach languages that you don't speak or can read? Mm -hmm. uh, I'd say some of us speak only one language, English. I personally speak three languages, and it really depends. Uh, what we use is Google Translate. Okay, basically. So uh, the team that works on Ukrainian research, like uh, I think. Uh, most of the team, of course, they don't speak Ukrainian or Russian. We have a new Ukrainian researcher, but still, majority of us are just uh, translating it from Google Translate. Yeah. So that's the thing. Um, so first of all, thank you for your work, giving us some um, proper journalism to read. Um, so two quick questions. First of all, how do you deal with, um, uh, I guess, uh, individual and uh, organizational uh, security and privacy? And secondly, how do you deal with organizations, individuals, intelligence, whatever, that are uh, basically pretending to be an adversary, like planting evidence, creating videos, uploading them, that are pretty like damn realistic? Mm -hmm. And how do you like deal yeah, with that? Yeah, sure, good question. Uh, for our security, yeah, we take it very seriously because we always get phishing uh, attacks from uh, yeah, different people, especially from the Russian government. And for that one, we uh, have our First of all, we have our security uh, um, person uh, and we follow the protocol. So one of the thing is uh, having the perfect cyber, uh, having our digital security very, very well maintained, uh, not clicking the links, uh, not having the same password, so the very basic stuff. But also for the physical security, I'd say there's only one, not visiting Russia. 
Uh, for uh, like smearing campaigns, sometimes it does happen. Uh, in this case, uh, we do uh, have a, a trauma risk management policy where if a person is getting harassed or something like that, they first of all can uh, approach to a psychologist, but we also have editors and um, uh, yeah, and basically the management staff who uh, can make a statement or who can take care of it or who can decide that it's better not to uh, reply to this Twitter user, for example. Does that answer your question? Uh, no. I the first, yes. the second, oh, okay. I'm sorry? Uh, Gummy, um, one question is enough. The other two you can ask later after. Will yeah, you yeah. Be here? I'll be here, okay? okay you can perfect. Sorry, maybe because I, this will be the final question uh -huh. because there are people standing on their legs for an hour already and I, I think we really need to wrap this up, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Hi, I was wondering if you are estimating the uniqueness of, uh, let's say, the, the stickers on the helmet and uh, the, the birthmarks because uh, the, there might be some collisions at some point. Say it again, sorry. There might be some collisions with other people having similar birthmarks mm -hmm. or similar stickers. Do you yeah. estimate that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so what we can do, so first of all, we look very closely at the birth birthmarks. They are actually hit around 10 and they were perfectly aligned. So in this case, we're like 100% sure that the same guy. But if a person doesn't really have this like birthmark or a tattoo that would give us 100% like that's the same person, we would go to, uh, for example, like Microsoft Azure's uh, tools to compare faces, okay? So, yeah, tools basically to compare faces. If it's higher than the 70% match, then we say it's the same person. So this basically, yeah, all good? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I do have a workshop on jail location in one hour, and then you can also right now catch me for other questions, okay? Ooh, that's cool. Yes. Yeah. <laughs>